Hi guys, welcome back to the Earthly Lights podcast, where this week we'll be talking about masculinity and what it means to be a man. But before we get into any of that, let's start off with what's the crack. So Jim, what is the crack? What's the crack, man? Um, the crack is, I just had an interview today, didn't go particularly well. So things have been better, but yeah, we're all, we're, we're thinking, you know. Devastating yeah, okay. news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's not too devastating it's it was just a bit of like a, a bit of a letdown and then honestly more i just feel bad because it's the third round and i think my dad was kind of getting excited about the possibility of me coming back and now i don't know so is this kind of last chance saloon then yeah. or will you be going back to dublin even if you fail at this interview yeah i mean i'm still i'm still looking at coming back here but it just means that like i really don't know when that could be you know yeah fair enough yeah. But yeah, other, other than that, man, things are good. Nice. I mean, the weather's atrocious here. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, nice, nice, windy and rainy. Um, and I've just been seeing my mates. Yeah, no, it's been it's been nice. What's the crack with you? Not too bad myself. Um, but today's uh, San Publicis in Spain, which is literally a day that the marketing sector has made up to give themselves an extra bank holiday. So I've had the day off. Well, when was it, when was this created? I don't exactly know when, but I think it's a fairly new revelation. I'd say like the last ten years, um, and they they found like a saint who's called, I think he's called Publicis, and so they just named the day San Publicis, and it's the last um, Friday of every January. <laughs> you get it off, completely paid for, uh, and it's just the Spanish typical Spanish just to be like <laughs> fuck this. I want another day's <laughs> holiday. I work too hard. For the little that I get paid. So I'm happy. Um, so that's what I've had today. Just a day off. And then I went to get a sports massage. Because I am starting jujitsu as of next Monday. So my back has been in a bit of pain recently anyway. So I thought right well it's going to be in a lot more pain once I get going with jujitsu. So I'm going to get that sorted. And I went to my physio and she like sorted me all out. And she did that thing where... You know, when they like grab your head and they like wiggle it around and then all of a sudden they just go <laughs> and like clicks it back into place. I was like, oh, Jesus. And she's like, yeah, your whole right side of your body is just loaded up. I'm like, oh, nice to hear. Did she t- did she tell you why that was the case? She was just like, look, it's so, she's like, there's so many reasons. She's like, do you sleep on that side? And I was like, well, I start to sleep on that side and the Lord knows how I end up in the mornings, but. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows how they finish. But exactly. But I do start um, on that side and then she's like, obviously I can tell that you're right handed. Which obviously that counts for a lot because everything you do is just predominantly on that side. And she's like, look, she's like, you're not terrible. She was like, it's just you're a classic case of someone who hasn't had physiotherapy for a while. And so they're just a bit out of joint. And so you kind of need to be straightened back up again, you know, because it's funny because so when she like did the head thing. So she turned it from the right to the left. So imagine your spine. Yeah, it's like it's slightly out of whack, but to the right. So she has to push that back in a bit. Do you get what I'm saying? So she pushes that back into the left, but then she did it the other way around as well. She's like, look, I don't think it's going to click or anything, but she's like, just to double check. So she turned my head from the left to the right and there was no click whatsoever. So it just go, went to show that like my spine was like out of place, but to the right, if you get what I'm saying. I mean, if any, I doubt we have any physio listeners to this, but if any physio listener is listening to this, probably like you've, absolute moron like that is not how it works but at least in my mind that's how i saw things going do you know what i'm saying so so i feel all nice and loose now but it was actually quite painful anyway let's not boring the poor listeners with the details of my physio and my um out of joint spine and let's get straight into the nitty gritty and the main segment which is about masculinity and what it means to be a man Just to give a bit of background and try and just tell people why we're doing this episode about masculinity, I saw recently a YouTube, a mini YouTube series from The Guardian, um, which was done by this reporter called Im, Imra, Iman Amrani. I hope I haven't butchered her name, but she did a really good job of interviewing men from all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different life experiences, and kind of getting their viewpoints of what it means to be a man and what masculinity means to them. And I think she did a fantastic job as a reporter. Agreed. Kind of 
get that all yep. encompassing viewpoint from so many different people. Uh, you there's six episodes, and I think you've seen three or four. The first three. Yeah, so there's six yep. in total. But basically, it's just such a good series. You know, she talked to people who are really interested in people like Jordan Peterson, for example, or they've come from an ethnic minority, so their life experience is very different because they kind of their parents have that immigrant mentality, kind of similar to my dad, or they're an older generation, they've gone to prison. And so it's really interesting. Um, but she had, in one of the episodes, she had three main questions, which kind of really interested you uh, and you want to start off with that so what were the questions yeah i thought the first question was definitely the most interesting and we could probably spend hours on it but the first question was how do you think your relationship with your dad has affected the man you are today yeah i think the relationship that you have with your father or the lack of relationship that you have with your father as a son is absolutely instrumental to how you grow up and what you perceive a man to be and what you think masculinity means I, I well like yeah it all depends like for instance there could be like the paternal father could be out of the picture but there could be a stepfather or like some other guardian yeah, yeah, yeah. just having that yeah having that male figure but a predominant male figure you know not not someone who's a footballer who you just yeah, admire yeah, yeah, yeah. from afar but someone who actually on a day-to-day mm-hmm. level is there for you like you said it can be whoever whoever it is that's brought you up basically but is a predominant male, male figure Uh, I just think it's so important. I think it has a lasting impact. I don't think it means that you have to become the carbon copy of that person. But I do think it's where a lot of your reference points come from. Uh, At least, at least that's my personal experience. You know, I've kind of touched on it before in the, um, the podcast that I did with Rosie, where we spoke about fathers and mental health and so on. And we touched on my relationship with my dad, but it has impacted me massively. And the way that he's a very, you know, he's Sicilian, born in the 1950s. So you can imagine, even without meeting him, you can just, if you just go off stereotypes alone, you can kind of imagine what he's like. And he's not too far off, you know, he's very traditional, very Italian, you know. And so when I, he he was always around and that was my reference point. You know, that's what I thought being, what an adult man looked like. That was what it was to me, it was my dad, as most people's were. And so he kind of... In, instilled not spoken you know he never actually outright said this is what you have to do to be a man but obviously when you see someone day in day out it's just it doesn't have to be spoken you know you just see how they are and so he kind of instilled in me that the man should always be the protect the protector the provider not just to the family but to your friends and did you ever sorry did you ever sorry did you ever witness your dad react to an alternative model of what he probably presumed to be quote-unquote masculinity well my mum would always argue that my dad had some sort of inferiority complex when it came to being a breadwinner because there were times where my dad was the breadwinner in terms of he was earning more and then there were times where my mum was earning more especially when my dad was starting up the business at the restaurant you know she's a lawyer so she earned quite well I can't categorically say whether that's true or not, to be honest. I think only my dad really knows whether that's true. But my dad definitely sees the world in a traditional um, way, viewpoint, you know. So it wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. Having said that, he kind of always saw the household income as a whole rather than we earn, I earn this and your mother earns this. It's more of a holistic approach if you get me what about you man if if louise was making more money than you would that be an issue at all i think in the ideal world i would say no but if i'm going to be completely honest there's probably there'd be something i think there'd be something niggling away at me i don't it wouldn't like be enough for me to lash out or to break us up or anything like that but i'm pretty sure there'd be some part where i would think you know where it's it, it would eat away at my ego to some extent i would i would think Having said that, I'd, I don't want Louisa to be, you know, uh, a stay-at-home wife. That's, that's not what I don't, because that doesn't attract me whatsoever. Like, I love what the what something that attracts me more than anything else in a woman, any woman, is that they've got, like, serious ambition uh, and that they don't want to be a housewife. There's nothing wrong with being a housewife. It's just not for me, do you know what I mean? So, and I know Louisa doesn't want to be a housewife. But yeah, if I'm going to be honest, I would assume that it probably would eat away at me to some extent. It's just whether that extent is big enough for me to, you know, to act upon it or where it's just like, Ugh, that's a bit annoying, but it is what it is. Okay, but if it did chip away your ego, do you not think that that would probably eventually be a good thing? 
Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah, like, you like look at it like that. I suppose it's just not. I, I've definitely got a big enough ego for it for some bits to be chipped away at. Um, no, no, it's without, not even like you. No, it's but not I get even what you say, personally. No, I get what you're saying. Yeah, like it, it would be. I, I think, I'm just trying to be honest. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know what the right answer is here. The right answer is to say, <laughs> oh, it wouldn't bother me whatsoever. I would actually be happy to be the stay-at-home dad. Like, I would love Louisa. Do you know what I mean, I know that's the correct answer. But I'm, the honest reaction is no. Like, I, I, would, I wouldn't be unhappy with it, but I wouldn't be happy with it. Does that make sense? It would just be like, oh, right, okay. So this is the dynamic we have now. But then having said that, the, the, the other part of me goes, I the way that I see money when it comes to a couple is I see it as our money. So, like, look, for example, Louisa and I earn X amount. I see that as the couple earns X, not I earn 21 and Louisa earns 20. No, I see it as, as a household, we earn 40. Do you know what I mean? Because um, there's, you know, there's strength in numbers, is that scale of economy. Okay, so but bring it back to your dad. Have you ever had a discussion with your dad about, what it means to be a man like or is it just all what you see you saw when you were a kid and then you've kind of inherited some of this accidentally or inevitably i've never had the outright conversation with my dad you know i've never asked him our oh, dad what does it mean to be a man like a simba and mufasa type moment but um my dad is quite judgmental <laughs> and so he would past judgment on people or people's actions and from there i would obviously you know i could tell what what he thought it was to be a good not necessarily man but to be a good human and then from there you know i can just kind of draw out what i know that my dad thinks like, i know exactly what my dad thinks it is to be a good man i don't i didn't need to have the conversation Do you know what i mean it was so clear that there was no even there was no need to even have the conversation like, i've never asked my dad do you like pasta because i know what the answer is uh, it's that same kind of vibes. So, I, like I said, it's it's the traditional, it's that traditional view, you know. I think most men of his era think that way. But then have you ever challenged him, like, lately, now that you have developed your own idea of what it means? Um, not lately, because I haven't, we haven't seen each other that much over the last few years because of I've moved to Madrid. And so when we do have conversations the conversation we have are kind of about the family and about this and about that. And we don't actually kind of have the privilege to delve into nice, interesting conversation. Cause it's almost like when we meet up, we have a news bulletin. Do you know what I mean? It's like, Oh, this is what I've been doing. Oh, this is what you've been doing. Oh, okay, cool. And it's like that for two days. And then I head back off to Madrid. So I haven't actually had the chance to, like we, have, we, just, we just haven't had the time to, in all honesty, but you know, I don't. It's not that my dad's an ogre or, or complete relic of the past, but for example, I'm sure that my dad thinks it's important and understands that it's important. Well, I know that I know this is the case. I know that he thinks it's and understands it's important to express your feelings and so on, and to not bottle it up, even though he continues to bottle things up. But he understands that you shouldn't. But equally, but he just can't take his own advice. Yeah, it's, it's hard for you to some. It's hard for you to change um, a way of life for 63 years, you know? Um, but equally having said that, I'm not, I don't think he would agree with the, the idea that men should cry whenever they feel it's necessary. You know, there's, it's kind of that juxtaposition whereby my dad recognizes this new modern thinking and to some extent agrees with it, even though he doesn't live by it, he does agree with it. But there's a cutoff point and there's a point where he goes, no, that's too far. Like there is, let's not just do away with the traditional view of a man because there are some good points there. And so there he has his limits. And I think, to be honest, I don't want to speak for men, but I think unless you're very introspective and very self-critical and so on, and very fluid in the sense of you're happy to change with the times and to really question your belief system, I think that's true of most men from his era. Like, what what would you think about your dad? Like, what, is your dad traditional or is he a complete modern man, even though he's, you know, whatever, 50, 60 years old? I would definitely wouldn't describe him as a modern man, but... I would also say, 
I would I would question whether yeah I would say in a similar vein to your dad that he would accept some of the prevailing trends particularly in terms of uh, like uh, emotional speaking maybe counseling these kind of things that would have been completely taboo for men in the 70s or 80s even um I think he accepts these things but again yeah like you said I guess it's it's like knowing one knowing one Knowing something is one thing, but then living by it is a, is a completely different thing. And I don't know if they, or m- my dad in particular, is willing to like go in and start like unwinding all the knots that have been knotted over the last like six decades, you know? Yeah, and I think we're all guilty of that, by the way. Like if everyone took their own advice, we would all be perfect human beings. You know, everyone is so good at giving advice and very few of us are actually good at taking it, you know? How would you say, just to, more specifically, uh, I'm going to put the question that you asked me at the start right back to you. How would you say that your relationship with your dad has impacted you and how you see masculinity and what it means to be a man? Uh, I would say he's without doubt the biggest influence on my life, yeah. Um, um, he's very inquisitive and he enjoys the kind of dance of an initial conversation. Uh, and he would very rarely just like you know sit back and uh, and let somebody else interrogate him he kind of enjoys being the instigator and trying to create some sort of bond straight away um and i i don't know if i necessarily have that but i remember um actually at my dad's birthday my my godmother said that to me at the at the party because i was seeing people that i hadn't seen so long i was just really enjoying the attempt to connect people that I knew but they didn't know and and she was like oh yeah you're just like your dad there um I think that's definitely one thing it, the love of music that's another thing um my dad grew up just or I grew up listening to music that my dad plays and music's a huge part of my life now even though I don't play an instrument I would like to though um and if I could bring it back to traditional masculine points i.e how is so for example how is your dad in the sense of when it comes to expressing emotion how has that affected you how is your dad when it comes to the um thought of being the protector the provider so does he subscribe to that thought and do do you as a result of that and you know the question that you asked me have you challenged your dad on his views now that you may potentially have some sticking points you know seeing as you're a millennial Okay, so the first one, what was the first one again? <laughs> there was a lot of questions there. Yeah. The first one was, ha- yeah, the first one is, just to bring it back to traditional masculine points, i.e. Um, expression, expressing emotion, uh, um, what else was it? Expressing emotion, um, being the protector, being the provider, all those types of things. How have you seen that in the sense of how he acts and how have you taken that on? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll answer that first. Uh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is that my dad has always provided, um, or he has always sh- like been very open, a very expressive, very emotional guy. Um, that's definitely something that I've taken. Um, taken as a given, yeah. I, I just grew up, I guess, um, with the idea that, of course, I should express myself, um, uh, particularly if it's maybe in a vulnerable state. But on the flip side, uh, I think this is where me and you might, dis- or might have different backgrounds. Uh, he definitely never really showed a violent side. And I think if you ask people who know me, they probably haven't seen a violent side to me either. And I've only actually been thinking about that recently, about how maybe that is. Um, I don't know, maybe I have subconsciously thought that violence was not something that should be expressed or even anger i mean i don't yeah that that's there was never a lot of anger or violence in the house and that certainly impacted me as well um yeah i i guess i need some more more time to unpack that but um on the flip side i I also have taken or have seen him just be incredibly selfless and like 
countless times him give you know like a ice cream cone to me and my sister who have dropped theirs or something and obviously that's a small example but he really is so selfless like he will always put, like put the kids put the family put his friends ahead and um yeah they're, they're, they're the main things that i that i take if you if you'd ask me sir yeah i i would i would just mirror that in the sense of the the family you know <clears throat> I think people can get it misunderstood when we say that our dads have made us want, have instilled that notion of being the provider and so on. It's not necessarily the sense of, oh, you have to be the one who earns more money. It's the sense of put your family before yourself at, at anything. And m my dad has always been that. My, he's, he's got many faults, as many of us, as we all have. But he always, 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 like you said, put us before him and before others at any point that he could do you know and i you know little things but i remember when we would have we would have uh, dinner parties around our house when i was younger and so you'd so my mum and dad would invite their friends around and they'd come obviously with their kids and obviously my mum my dad's a fairly good little like house chef and so he would you know be cooking up a storm and the kids would get the exact same food and we'd get it first and i remember my friends parents always making a comment like oh you're gonna give my son like a uh, beef fillet with like this this and this and do you know what i mean and some truffle pasta and stuff my dad's like yeah of course why would i not and oh you're gonna serve them first and that's like well yeah they're the kids of course they're gonna eat before we eat you know in the sense of they should have the best plate and then we'll have what's left over type thing because we're adults we can deal with it whereas when i went round to their house you know, the parents would have whatever it was, beef fillet and truffle pasta, for example, and we would have chicken nuggets and pizza, you know? And it's just that whole thing of, like, my dad never, ever treated us differently. He never treated us as, as like, inferior human beings because we were five years old. He always gave us the best. If he... He would often cook. In fact, I remember this would happen all the time. He would always cook, and my he would always say, does anyone want anything? Because I'm about to cook some pasta or whatever. And I'd say, yeah, I'll have some. So he'll cook a, a portion for me. And my sister and my mum would always say, no, we're fine, thanks, don't worry about us. And then my dad would cook up a storm. He would bring it back into the living room. We'd be sitting watching the TV. And then my mum and my sister, every single time, would always go, what's that you've got there? And I'd be like, I told you, it's blah, blah, blah. Or normally a pasta dish. And then they'd say, oh, can I just try a little bit? And then they would try a little <laughs> bit. And before you know... And this is like 100% the case. And then before you know it, they'd have half, if not three quarters of the bowl. And my dad would be left with the scraps. And, but he never, like he would complain in a jokey sense, in the sense of, I tell you every time I'm going to cook, I always ask if you want me to cook. You always say no. Why don't you just say yes and I'll cook it for you. But he would never not give them it. Do you know what I mean? And that, and that was with everything. He would work late hours. He would often go on, you know, I remember once he went to South Africa for months at a time. That wasn't because he loved to travel, you know. He did that because that's what allowed us to have the best possible start in life and what allowed us to go to the best schools and to have the best house and, you know, whatever else. He didn't do that because he loved to go away from his kids. Um, so, to me, that was the impression that when I say my dad instilled in me that as a man you're supposed to be a provider and a protector, that's what I mean. I don't mean that he instilled in me that I'm supposed to earn more than Louisa or that come if someone ever spoke badly about Louisa, I'm supposed to smash their head in. What I mean is that you're like you said, it's that selflessness and just to put your family, your wife included before you at every turn. And that's something that's really stayed with me. And that's a traditional aspect of masculinity that I think is really honorable and something that we shouldn't just um, discard. You know, I, I hope that I pass that on to my son and that he passed it on to his son if he is to have one and so on and so forth because I just think it's such a good trait to have. And look at us, we're both talking about our dads in a, almost in awe because your dad gave you a, 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 an ice cream cone when you dropped yours and because my dad would give me pasta, you know? It sounds yeah. so stupid, but yeah, at the age of 23 and whatever else, we still remember it and it's left a lasting impact on I us. Yeah. so that's something i would i would 100 percent agree and it was just because it was on such a consistent basis like there was yeah yeah, yeah it wasn't once yeah. um man have you ever had a male model 
a, a male role model that wasn't your dad? Not when I like when I knew you were gonna ask this question, I was trying to like wrap my brain. I was thinking, who did I like look up to that wasn't my dad? Um, or who did I just look, look up to in general? And I was trying to think, and the only person that I can think of that when I was young, I looked up to was Thierry Henry. But that's only yeah, but that's only because I loved Arsenal and he was our best player by a country mile, um, and so I just looked up to him. But it wasn't in the sense of, or oh, what can Thierry Henry teach me, and what can I learn from Thierry Henry's life? It was just that infatuation that you have as a kid with, especially if you're into sports with a sports star, you know. But I didn't really have someone where I went, oh yeah, he's my role model. And to be fair. If you asked me when I was 10 years old, who's your role model? I wouldn't have even said my dad. Like it was, when I was younger, I didn't like look up to my dad and go, oh, I want to be you. It's only in the later years that, I, that I've looked back and gone, their traits that my dad's taught me or that my dad showed that I want to take on in life, you know? It's only in hindsight that I would maybe call my dad a role model, but I wouldn't have done so when I was 10 years old or even 15. What about yourself? No, I, I I I would definitely have picked a footballer also, but then what about you? If you were late teens or early twenties, did you have somebody that you aspired to be like? I guess or that showed traits that really resonated with you that you might not have seen with your dad. Um, I've never, and this is gonna sound cocky and gonna come off bad probably but it is what it is i've never looked up to someone and gone i want to be like them genuinely honestly i can say that i've never done that and okay but, because but, but, i you're gone but be, be inspired by someone okay well th- you're gonna laugh but um and i'd say it's probably the it's been since i was about 20 years old since i've got into podcasts but genuinely joe rogan and i say that because He's probably the per in terms of hours. He's probably the person that I listen to the most that I don't know on a personal level. You know, that's not a Louisa or that's not a you or that's not one of my best mates. Because I he releases what four or five podcasts every week and they're always two hours long and I listen to them from start to finish every single podcast because I do it at work and stuff like that. So naturally, if you listen to someone for ten hours a week on an average, naturally whatever their dogma is, is going to seep into your, into your veins. So that's just natural, you know? Um, but apart from that, apart from the simple physics of it, I actually really admire him. I think he's inquisitive. He's very self, um, critical. He's always self analyzing, you know, he's always asking, why am I thinking this way? He's always neutral when it comes to learning something he doesn't try to enforce, um, uneducated opinions on other people he's very willing to learn and to actually say oh i didn't know that or i never looked at it that way that's a good way of looking at it which i think not many of us have that trait and i'm trying to learn to have that trait and i also just i agreed massively with his um his viewpoint of go after it you know if there's, if there's something you want do it now don't wait uh and try to do things on your own terms you know live life by your own on your own terms and i think to me that's what that's what i define as success is living life on your own terms and you know if that if that that can mean whatever that means to each different person to me that means ultimately not having a boss to me that means if i want to wake up on a tuesday and i want to do hot yoga or do do jujitsu or go to a nice cafe and write an article or whatever, then I can do that. And I don't have to ask for, for permission. And Joe Rogan's a huge advocate of that. Obviously, if you just look at his lifestyle. So I'd say he's probably the man that I've looked up to the most or been inspired or have traits that I would like to have, I guess. What about yourself? Uh, people know I love Russell Brand. <laughs> Russell, Russell Brand, uh, since he kind of started doing YouTube videos with the Trues, uh, maybe in like 2013 or 2014, and now he moved on to podcasts, maybe 2016, 2017. Yeah, man, I was just super inspired by his honesty. Um, by, like you said, like his self-reflexivity. Um, his humor as well his ability to add humor into aspects of life that probably don't have too much humor traditionally anyway um, 
But it's funny, I was talking to this guy when I was in Denmark and he asked me a similar question. And I said Russell Brand and then I love a guy called Gabor Mate, who's a doctor, like a specialist in addiction and trauma. And he asked me why. And I said, oh, I, I just think he's so honest. Uh, he's so genuine. I really appreciate that about him. And he was like, um, be careful. Yeah, be careful about people that you think are uh, very transparent and open because maybe they're just transparent and open about the things they want to be transparent and open about, you know? And it's kind of something that we've been <laughs> talking about with this podcast as well. It's like, yeah, we, we want to be open, but then, okay, where does, where does the book stop? Well, yeah, know? and because also I think because being honest, it affects other people, you know? There's, That's it. There's parts That's of it. my life yeah, yeah. that I would happily talk about on this podcast um, but I know that if I did so, that would implicate other people who aren't comfortable with it or for very understandable reasons, you know? So how do we navigate those waters in the sense of, I'm not lying to you, and I'm not trying to withhold information, but equally these are, you know, the people that I care most about. So I don't want to just blur out something on a podcast and then all of a sudden I put someone who I love into a pile of, of shit again, you know? So I think it comes with caveats, you know? It might not be that he's... He maybe he's being honest and open or being reserved about something, but not because he wants to be reserved, but because he's doing it for the better, for the good of someone else, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um what's the what was the third question, the last question that The last question that she asked because of the strong correlation or the the high rates of uh males committing um terrorist acts and knife crime. She was asking was uh, aggression and uh, the, the high levels of aggression or aggression natural in men or is it kind of taught um, through media or through society, I guess. And um, I thought that was a really good question. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts? I think it's, it's hugely taught because I was actually only reading this book yesterday and it was highlighting how if we are just watching movies and dramas traditionally when we see like men receive uh, news that hurts their ego they almost exclusively react in violence uh, whether that's to a wall to another person to themselves um, and unconsciously of course you're going to adapt that you know because I, like Obviously, women get angry often as well, but yeah, it, it's 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 very. You see it a lot less in in films or in dramas, or in media. Full stop. Women getting angry compared to men getting angry, and I think. But I think, see, I think this is where we're going to differ on this podcast because I think yes, I agree with you that it's definitely shown in the media and so on and so forth. But I think the reason it showed is because, personally, I think it's a reflection of real life. If I look at a lot of the girls that I talk, that you know, my, all of my girlfriends, Louisa, my my family members that are girls, when they get angry, they often cry, and it's not because they're crying because they're upset. Because I would always, when it first started happening, I was always like, "Why are you crying?" Like, like well, you should be, you should be angry right now, and they're like, I am angry, I'm furious. That's why I'm crying, and it's because they. I mean, a girl would be able to say this much better than I will be, but from what they I, they've told me is because they just get so pent up with the emotion of anger and fury and whatever else that their way of kind of just naturally their way of releasing that is a tear will come out. It might be one tear, it might be two tears, it might be a flood of tears, but either way they cry. Right now, for a man, that isn't natural. How many men do you know that? I'm not saying that we don't cry. I'm saying when it comes to anger, when we get angry, we don't cry. We will cry when we get upset. That's why it took me aback when I would see these girls crying when they're angry. I'm like, that's something that I associated with sadness. It's not something I associated associated with, with anger. When a man, but does that stem? But does that stem from ages ago? Man, I no, because listen, when I was growing up, up younger, I would ne- I didn't watch um, whatever it was films that would show m- men punching walls i'm talking you know i'm talking when i'm four years old i didn't watch that stuff but when i was angry or in the playground when boys would get angry with each other they would it, the immediate thing would be they would push each other over and then you'd have a little fight when you're four years old because you didn't get the lego piece you wanted or whatever it may be whereas the four-year-old girls who again they didn't watch films they weren't impacted 
when they would get angry, they would, one of them would run off and one of them would cry, one of them would tell the teacher or whatever. The ways of reacting were completely different. It wasn't because as a four-year-old I saw, you know, a film and thought, oh my God, look, there's da there's Daniel Craig punching a wall because he's angry. I know what I'll do. Next time I'm angry, I'm going to punch a wall. It's like, no, like, that's how, you know. No, 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 no. But, but the the media influence comes later. But what that guy, uh, the doctor, I like about Matt Day, he highlights that the the years that we don't really remember are hugely formative for our brain and how we uh, react uh, instinctively or uh, like uh, quickly. So I'm saying that from zero to four, where I have absolutely no recollection, I'm assuming that I didn't see a lot of violence because. Obviously, yeah, I got angry as a kid, but there was never any, like, real act out of violence. And I have uh, a hinting uh, hypothesis that men who do get very angry in certain instances may have been exposed to this violence um, during these years where they don't even recall them. I mean, you know, if I look back on my, if I look back on my childhood, my dad has a short temper. He's a little, yeah, the, the stereotype, the little um, traditional angry Sicilian, yeah? My dad has a temper. I had that temper too. Now, my dad, when I say get violent, he, he wouldn't punch me or stuff. But yeah, he would do that, yeah, the, the classic man thing of shouting, whatever, maybe like, whatever, you know, the classic man thing. So yes, I would have seen that. But I, whilst to some extent that's definitely impacted me, I'm sure, like it definitely has, and you take traits from your parents, don't you? Of course you do. So if my dad was a Buddhist monk, I'm sure maybe my temper wouldn't be what it is. Um, but I also do think that you can't, I, I think it's impossible to deny that there is some part of nature that comes in to men being more um, open or more willing to go to violence um, straight away and aggression as a, as a court, as a measure to solve a problem than women you know if you look back i was reading the book sapiens which is just all about human history well if you look back to the earliest times what were the men the men were the foragers and they were the hunters and they were the protector of the little village or if it wasn't a village of the cave that they were staying in at that moment in time there was a saber-toothed tiger that came along it was the men that would go out and try to kill the saber-toothed tiger if it was another village that was trying to come in and take them take over it was the men that would go out and fight right and this is just played out all along through history now obviously if you look at you know you look at armies now back in the olden days it was all men now there are more women obviously in armies but if you look at the percent i don't know percentages off the top of my head but we all know that the percentages will be vastly in favor of men it's the same with if you look at combat sports now if you look at mma which she actually interviews a couple of she goes to an mma event and interviews a couple of mma um uh, fighters but if you look at mma or you look at boxing the yeah, there's are there are some um, female boxers and there are some female um, fighters and very good ones, but it doesn't appeal to them as much as it appeals to a gen to a man. And I think there's some. But is that because it's more accepted for the man to be fighting rather than the woman? Slightly, but that's not the only reason. To say that's the only reason would be ludicrous. No, it's, there's there's no no. I'm there's not definitely it's the only you have to, yeah. There's, there's there's so many con there's so many things that come into this, right? Yes, it is definitely more accepted to see to see a, a male fight. Although I think that's changing, but at the moment, at the time of the recording, yes, it is more accepted. Um, is it? But then you look at other things. Well, you, but there's nature involved. You know, a man is naturally more predispositioned towards aggression, towards violence than a woman is. That's just that that is just natural facts. If you go out onto a if you go out onto a night out, right? Women like drunk men and drunk women are there. Drunk women argue, drunk men argue. How many of those drunk arguments that that of women on women, how many of them end in a cat fight? Hardly any. How many times do you see on a night this out? Is, this is anecdotal evidence, sir, uh, but we can <laughs> Yeah, it's anecdotal, but like there's part... What I'm trying to say is, at the end of the day, the argument is nature or nurture. That's what we're arguing over here, right? No, but I, I don't... I'm not saying either or. I'm just saying we... Is, I'm just questioning the degree of which, you know? I, I think it's 50-50. You think it's 50-50? I think I think there's definitely a part of us that we grow up as men 
and we're it's just natural in us you have testosterone for christ's sake that's a hook that is biological and that brings out this emotion to some extent it brings out the aggression and the the it, it helps you with violence you know it helps you go into battle is the testosterone right well that is naturally a more male um a more male hormone. I mean, women have it, but they have it at a lesser extent, just like estrogen. Women have more estrogen than men do. Men have estrogen in their bodies. We just don't have it to the same extent as women. So that is literally a bio that's biological proof to some extent that aggression is inbuilt within us. Now, like you said, I do I think there's social factors that contribute towards aggression being more accepted or the go-to when it comes to a man expressing his anger. You know, that's that's definitely that is definitely true. But I don't I think to say that it's or to put or to argue that it's more heavily in favour of the media and society and this, that and the other, and that it's got little or nothing to do with nature is a difficult argument to make. You know? That doesn't mean that you can't control it, by the way. I'm not trying to um excuse violence or aggression when it's not warranted because I've seen that within my own family and I've seen that within myself where I've got angry for the stupidest of things and gone, there was no reason to get that angry, you know, and I can definitely hold that back. So I'm not trying to excuse it. I'm just saying that it's something that men have to deal with. Uh, and it's definitely a natural thing, I think, to some extent, to a large extent, personally. We, I guess we'll agree to disagree on the minor details of it then. <laughs> We're definitely, we will on this one. I definitely think we should address vulnerability though within masculinity because I think it's the key difference between masculinity from when our parents were growing up and masculinity these days. I think it's far more acceptable to be vulnerable uh, even though hyper masculinity is still kind of definitely out there and definitely being pushed by some people and I think I recently watched the film Waves and so have you and I think it kind of touches on both sides of that coin, you know, um, you've got the hyper masculinity and then you've got the them breaking the walls down and becoming more vulnerable. So do you want to just start touch on that and talk about that first? Yeah, man, the movie Waves has some really special scenes. One scene in particular where um, the dad and the daughter are fishing. And um, I don't want to ruin, I, I, this is hard to, to, to describe when someone who hasn't seen the movie but wants to see the movie. But anyway, the dad is um, asking the daughter how she been doing recently and she seems kind of tight and a bit closed. Um, and she says, yeah, like I, she kind of brushes off the question. And then she asks, how are you doing? And then he really just lets his guard down and completely opens up and tells her the struggles that he's going with uh with the with his wife and with the whole situation that the family are going through and then after he finishes expressing himself the daughter then just like picks up on this like really resonates with this and then really like unleashes all of this pent up like emotion and anger that she had for like the previous months and i really thought it was nice because it's it was like a, how would I say, like a, a promotion of the idea that like connection comes through vulnerability. You know, I don't know how much uh, if the daughter would have, if the daughter would have expressed herself as she did, if he wasn't first to to say, oh, this is really how I'm feeling. And it was, um, yeah, it's something I've been thinking about recently. How if you want stronger connections with people, you need to be more open with yourself like connected with yourself but also willing to express this because this really does encourage and and let's and shows people that yeah yeah i can do this yeah i 100 percent agree and not to ruin the film for anyone who hasn't watched it but also within the film you see that relationship with the father that same father and his son and it's a very hyper masculine relationship they don't really open up to each other and he just is kind of it's almost like a soldier and a, and a general type relationship, which I can relate to to some extent because my pair, well, my relationship with my dad was like that until recently and we've started to become more open and honest with each other. And I've realised within myself that when I've become open and started to share what's tr been troubling me recently, be it with a friend or whoever it may be, or family members, or obviously Louisa, then they begin to open up as well and it's just this process. And I think when people realise that you're vulnerable and you have 
uh, obviously your own shit going on in your life, but you're willing to accept that and to talk about it, then it, I think, encourages them to talk about their own problems, you know, because they realise that it's a safe space here and there's complete honesty and trust and there's no need to live up to uh, this image or create this facade that life is always good because we all know that that's not the case. Some have it worse off than others, you know. But I realise that having become more vulnerable and being more in touch with my feelings, I've become a better friend, I've become a better brother, I've become a better son, I've become a better boyfriend, I've just become a better man in general. And I think that men who are more in touch with their feelings, men who are more vulnerable, men who don't have to live up or don't want to live up to this image that we've created for ourselves that we have to be macho all the time i think that will create a better society and it will have that trickle down effect and i think men that are vulnerable when the time is right can be a real force for good and a force for change and we can change the stereotype that men don't cry and men are these emotionless beings and robots you know yeah i wish i could remember where i heard this but i remember somebody was talking about um connection and how for instance if me and you both like arctic monkeys or something oh that's great we're talking at a party we talk about our favorite songs we play the music and it's it's real it's real nice but there's just um something in inherently like deeper when i say here like seb like i'm 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 fearful of this or like this is what this is what's going on with me really like um and then you say, oh, I have a, I'm in a similar place. I'm in a similar place. That is a is a profoundly <laughs> different and pro- and deeper uh, sharing, you know. Um, and it's not that like we shouldn't talk about our favorite bands or anything. I'm not saying that, but I think if people were um, people who are hesitant, if they knew the connection that could come from this vulnerability that they would be way more likely to do it you know way more likely to express yeah i also think that when someone opens up to you it just in you know it just invites them opening up to you to open up to them as well when there's that confidence that's been placed and that honesty is in that conversation you know if someone just told you whatever their deepest darkest secret is or their fear or whatever it may be i think then it's very difficult to follow that up with um, oh yeah, well Arctic Monkeys song has just been released. Do you want to get tickets? You know, it can't, you, you can't just switch conversations like that. Or at, at the very least, if they can't share with you, then they'll at least ask you more about your own problem, and then you have a real meaningful conversation. I also think uh, being vulnerable has a lot to do with violence. We've just spoken about it now, and I'm kind of of the idea that maybe it's more, it's fifty fifty, and you think maybe it might be more to do with nurture. But I definitely think that if from a young age, boys saw their fathers open up and talk about their feelings, cry, be vulnerable, and not be these stoic men that we've all kind of grown up with. I think we would be definitely less predispositioned to go towards violence when we um, experience anger or fury. You know, when I see girls uh, get angry, they often try to talk it out first before, well, before they even get to anger, they try to talk it out. And I think that's because they've been taught that they can actually talk about their feelings and it's not weak, it's not silly to do so, you know? And I think men are pressure cookers. And if we had that ability just to open up and to talk about our feelings when and as and when they occur, then I think that would just let off a bit of steam and we wouldn't have to resort to punching a wall or worse still actually punching somebody else. Uh, I think you can see that in waves, you know, in the film, the son and the dad have this very traditional uh, masculine, hyper-masculine relationship going on. And I think to some extent, he, the dad forces the son to take the route he takes. And in fact, the mother actually blames the father for that, for being such a hard ass on his, on his own son. And, and it pushed him down a route of violence uh, that maybe he would have, wouldn't have chosen had the situation been different. Uh, so yeah. There's so many things to take from it. Well, what has also got me thinking about how is if, for instance, your friend, are you, say your friend does express themselves and something that maybe isn't usually talked about and they express their fears and whatever, but you don't particularly have something of a similar uh, degree that you feel like you need to express also. What Wave got me thinking yesterday was that when you do that anyway, what you're doing is like leaving the door open. 
So, for instance, you might not have something to come back, like, to to equally share. You just want to be there for your friend. But by him or her sharing to you, then you can two months down the line go, oh, I really appreciate it. I remember he told me this. Now I'm in this. Now I can explain to him or explain it to her, you know. And I think that's also really important because, um, you know, there's, there's going to be times where you don't have um, a similar level or st- the similar strength of feelings uh, to express but by expressing you're just leaving that door open just going i'm letting you know that i i trust you with this information and i trust to, that we can possibly talk about this in the future or similar vulnerable topics in the future yeah i think that's a really good point well made and for the second time in this brief history of this podcast i've come to the conclusion that being vulnerable being open being able to cry whatever that may be is so beneficial to men in general and i think it just makes us better makes us stronger makes us better humans um so i think if we had seen waves beforehand we would definitely would have recommended it on the kanye west and sorry the joker and the kanye west podcast because i think we've both been quite impacted by it even though we watched it completely separate but i guess to be fair being vulnerable comes with having that confidence that you can be vulnerable in front of people and i suppose that depends on people's circumstances and friendships that they have you know yeah i mean i obviously can only speak from my experience but i have also heard people tell me that they probably don't have the luxury that i maybe have in terms of having quite a understanding compassionate circle of friends family etc so well yeah i love like you're right yeah like there's no way that that a um expression yourself isn't the way forward but i still do think depending on the circumstance people need to be careful because unfortunately there are circumstances and sometimes people take advantage of quote-unquote perceived weakness you know yeah i 100 get what you're saying um having said that i would always say this is just talking from my personal experience if someone takes your quote-unquote uh, perceived weakness as uh, something that they can take advantage of, then that speaks more about them than it does about you. And I, for me personally, the more people I've told about whatever it is that I'm going through, it's just a weight lifted off my shoulders. And I just feel like I'm walking freely. And uh, if people take that as something that they think they can take advantage of, well, then more for them, you know. But just to move on, there's a couple of points that like that come outside of those three questions that that I think are really important when it comes to. Uh, what it means to be a man what it means to be a good man and so on and so forth and i think maybe i mean to some extent my point i'm going to bring up is linked more to humanity than masculinity but i think having a meaning and having a purpose having an objective is so important to men um and why i say to men is because we're built you know like i said we're told from the get-go right that you're supposed to be the provider you're supposed to be the breadwinner this that and the other and i think sometimes the realization that because when you when you hear that as a young kid you think you know you've got all the enthusiasm in the world and you think oh i'm going to be a footballer and that will give me and i'll be a breadwinner by being a footballer and then you realize oh i'm not going to be a footballer like i'm there's no way i'm going to be a footballer and before you know it you're working in an office you're working in a, a job that you have no actual hobby or no interest in whatsoever right and that doesn't give you meaning anymore. Like you've lost your sense. You're, you've lost. You've come off the path. You know, it's just like it's like I saw Jordan Peterson saying this thing, and it's a good a good analogy. No one goes to a shooting range and just shoots a rifle. You have to have a target. Otherwise, shooting the rifle just into midair, there's no fun in that. But you have to have that target to aim at, right? And I think when you don't have that target, when you don't have that aim, it can you can really start to unravel. And I was, in fact, I was just talking to one of my friends, Ollie, recently, and he was just asking me how the podcast is going and so on and so forth. And I said, man, I don't want to be, I don't, you know, I don't want it to be hyperbole, but, or to go over the mark here, but this podcast has really given me uh, a direction. It's really given me almost a new lease on life, a motivation, because I've now got something that is mine, which I've always wanted. You know, I'm not, I'm not, like I said, I don't want to work for someone for the rest of my life. So I've now got something that's in my own hands that, that I choose, you know, along with you, obviously, we can choose where this goes to some extent, depending on the work that we put in and so forth. And 
it's really given me, like I said, a, a direction in my life. And I, I was missing that for a long time. And it was something that I was really struggling with, coming, trying to come to terms with the fact that my life was going to be clock in at nine and clock out at five for the rest of my life until I was 70 years old and retired. And I just couldn't accept that because I've always had big, maybe stupidly or maybe because I'm egotistical or whatever that may be, but I've always had kind of these grandiose dreams of what my life would be. And then the reality that I was living was like, oh, this is, this is so far away from what I was hoping. I was starting to unravel myself and I was starting to lose what, what it meant to be Seb, you know? And I think that's so important for, for someone to have, for anyone, man or woman, but for men, I think it's so important to have that sense of direction. And then I think, you know, people always say, oh, a friend of mine, I said this to another friend of mine, and she came back with, yeah, people always say, she said, I'm so happy to, to hear that from you. She said, people always say, you know, you should, it doesn't work fine. If you hate work, it doesn't matter, it's fine. Because as long as you know, you have your little hobbies like the gym and you see your friends, then that's, you know, then that's a, a good life. And she said, but that doesn't give you meaning. She said, you don't wake up in the morning because you're going to see your friends. You don't wake up in the morning because you're going to lift weights. She said, you have to have a goal, an objective to strive for. And seeing your friends and going to the gym and keeping on top of your health, that's all great, but they're byproducts, you know? That's, that should, that shouldn't be, that's not your number one objective. And I think she hit the nail on the head there. Lara, if you're listening, shout out to you. But... Um, I don't know if you agree with me or what's your, what your take on that is, if you've struggled with that at all. Um... It's funny you say that, man, because this week I've been thinking the exact same thing with the podcast. And even, you know, when you're asking me about, uh, you know, future episodes and when we're free and stuff, there's like a bit of me that's like, ah, ah, ah. But then there's a bit of me that says like, ah, oh, this is great. This is the first time that, um, that I have... Uh, a consistent um, avenue to like yeah a, a, like a means to express myself um, yeah because I haven't had that the last few years I mean bits and bobs man but it's been fleeting um, you know a bit like when you're a kid and um you know, when you're a kid and you, well, I don't know about you, but like I see Wimbledon and then I, w- I want to play tennis, so I want to play tennis. And then my dad buys me a tennis racket and then, you know, then it's October, November and you can't play tennis in Ireland anymore then unless, yeah, so that's gone. And yeah, and then I remember uh, when rugby season comes around, my dad would buy me a rugby ball because I'd beg him and also the little kicker, the little thing that you use to kick the ball. And I'd be into that for a while and then it would just fade away and then football would come back again. And then I even went through phases of loving table tennis, badminton, it, like all of that in, in my teens. And I think it was similar uh, and still is kind of similar for me now, even... Like the last few years, I've really been trying to find things. I'm like, oh yeah, is this the thing? And I think the beauty of the podcast is like, it could be the thing, but because it's so broad and we can talk about anything, it doesn't have to be restrictive at all. You know, like I was thinking, oh, when I was getting into yoga, I was like, oh, is this the thing? Or with meditation, is this the thing? And um, yeah, and and the fact that you text me and you're like, all right, we're going to record next, it's... Uh, <laughs> I have to remind myself to be really grateful of it because otherwise I would still be like going to the shooting range and not really shooting. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I, I think when I look at it, the people that are happiest or seem to lead the happiest lives or the most better than happy, the most fulfilling lives are the ones who know what they're aiming for. They have a clear passion, a clear, a clear goal, and they just go for it 100%. There's no other distractions, you know? And I, man, I'm like you. I when I first when I was younger, I was like, oh yeah, I want to be a footballer, and I love football. But like, I never had. I mean, firstly, I never had the skill. But but apart from that, I never had the actual real drive to go out in the rain and go run around the tr- go run around the pitch, and to not go to parties so I could practice on my free kicks. You know, forget it. Even if I had the skill, which I didn't, I didn't have that drive because I didn't have the ultimate passion that footballers have. Then. Like you said, it was just one thing after the other. Oh, yeah, I like this. I dip my toes in it. And then I'm like, yeah, it is what it is. And back out. And then I think for the longest time, and I'm, just, I'm trying to decide now whether it is what it is. But 
for the longest time, I sold myself the dream or that I wanted to run a restaurant or a bar. And I've told every person I know that that's what I want to do. And I think part of me told everyone I knew that's what I wanted to do because it was like, if I tell everyone, then I have to go through with it, you know? But now that I've done this podcast, I'm kind of like, I'm not sure, you know? I don't, we'll have to see where this podcast goes. I don't want to take it, you know, let's not run before we can even walk. But there's part of me that goes, well, this is actually really interesting me interesting to me running the podcast not just the podcast the website you know being able to put up articles whenever we want to on the website um to try and get guests on to interview them the whole like chase to see if we can get someone on and and hound them down to basically like to to surrender and say yeah fine we'll come on your podcast (laughs) all of that stuff is so interesting to me and i'm like well if we can make a go if we can really make something of this then i will I don't know, I don't want to speak for myself in 50 years time, but I could happily see myself doing this for for a long term. And the, you know, the feedback that we've had from people, the people have had little criticisms in terms of volume and this and that and whatever, but they're just technical things. But the resounding thing that I've got is people love the idea. And if they, if they love the idea, then we've got something to work with. You know, I'd rather the idea was great and we can be better in terms of the professional aspect of the podcast rather than the sound system be amazing everything be amazing the way that we talk is perfect but the idea is actually dud because then you've got nothing and i think i'm like human and i think you know what i think so many people the majority of people are searching for something to give their life some sort of purpose and to give them an aim and objective and i think that's what has led to this huge kind of void that needs to be filled by people like Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan or whatever because people are just dying for someone to give them a purpose someone to tell them what to do because they're lost in the wilderness Um, and I I mean I'm still I am still there I think I still I think I'm still lost in the wilderness but I think I can just about see the path through the bushes you know and I think it's so important, man. I think I, I don't think it can be overstated. And I think maybe it's not slightly, it's not really a masculine thing. I think that's just human beings in general. But um, I think they're the luckiest people are the people who find, you know, whether you're uh, a David Beckham or a Brian O'Driscoll or a this or a that, and you find what it is that you want to do for the rest of your life when you're five years old. Well, that's a very lucky individual because they've had, they have a purpose for their whole life. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. For, you could you could say that they're lucky, but also, um, maybe they don't have the same appreciation for someone who has been searching for thirty years and then finds it. You know, that feeling was, was would probably be, be pretty special. But I think I'd I'd go without the appreciation to be honest, man, and just have the uh, <laughs> the objective from the get go. <laughs> I'd happily sell the thirty no, years man. of appreciation to like know what I want to do from the from the age of five and just go for it all like one hundred percent. And I also think there's something um, you, there was always this saying, right? And it uh, what is it? Um, something about failure, fail bigger next time, or something along those lines. Um. I basically just being like the whole thing of like, don't be scared to fail. Was it, you can fail, fail again, but fail bigger or something along those lines. And I never kind of really got it. I was like, well, that sounds like a load of shit to be honest. Um, But I think I kind of understand. And there's something really brave about going for an objective, right? Following something 100% because it makes you vulnerable because if you never give your 100% at something, then you you never really fail at it. Do you know what I mean? So you can say, like, I never really tried to be a professional footballer. So I never really failed at being a professional footballer. The fact that I'm not one doesn't mean that I failed because I never really tried to be one. Whereas if I went to every training session and if I got my dad to drive me up and down the country and I did try to do all of the, everything possible to be a footballer and there never was one, well, then I failed. And I think that is something that scares a a lot of people off trying to do something. And I think, you know, with this podcast, I've spoken to a lot of people about it before we'd launched, obviously a lot of my friends and stuff. And a lot of my friends, since it's been launched, have like said, um, 
and some of the Facebook comments and shares or whatever have, have said this, which is, I can't believe you've actually finally done it. Um, like, well done, so proud, blah, blah. But a lot of my friends said, I can't believe you've done it. I thought this was just another one of your big ideas because I'm, I'm one for having a million ideas, but often I very seldom follow through with it. And I think there's definitely a part of me which is like, well, I can talk the good game, but I'm not sure I actually want to go through with it because what happens if I fail and I don't make it and then I look like an idiot in front of everyone, you know? And I think a lot of my friends probably thought the same with this podcast. They probably thought, oh, yeah, Seb's talking the good game, but he won't actually ever launch it. And that's fair enough because if I had a friend like me, I'd probably think the same. But to put yourself out there and to go, look, we've launched this podcast, we've launched the website, we've done this, we've done that, here's the artwork – we hope you like it. And then just to carry on putting content out there and to aim to to make it into something that's really positive and really is an actual thing that people are listening to that aren't just our friends. There's something vulnerable about that because in five years' time, if this podcast comes to nothing, the haters could just be like, oh, look, what a failure, you know? Whereas if we never put this out, then the haters can never say anything. So I think... Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because you go, oh, well, I'm not a failure. Because if you don't try anything, you never fail at anything. That's just facts, you know? And I think that's another thing where I think maybe a lot of people, some people might know what they want to do, but they might be scared to take that first step and to actually throw themselves into it. Because when you have a hobby, that's lovely. You know what I mean? It's just, and that, that hobby can be anything. Before we started this podcast, the hobby that I had, or one of them was talking about these things with you or with other friends in per, in person but then the minute you make a step to make it you take a step to make it into something whatever that may be so if your hobby is cooking but then you take that first step and, and you want to go to culinary school and then you want to launch a restaurant and stuff that first step of going to culinary school is scary because you're turning your hobby into something that actually is now more than that and because you can't fail at a hobby but you can fail at something that you're trying to make your job you know, that's man, you, when you were talking about this, right, it reminds me of um, Jim Carrey said a very similar thing. Do you, do you remember that documentary that he that came on Netflix? It was on Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says that he, he remembers one of his earliest memories when he was a kid was his dad coming home who didn't like his job. And his dad came home and he had informed the family that he lost his job. And then Jim Carrey said, like, that was the time that I realized that if you could fail at something that you didn't want to do, you might as well fail at something that you want to do, you know? Yeah, I, I, I remember I remember it now you having said it. And again, you just can't. Ha how can you disagree with that point? But it, even if you know that that's like, it's what we said right at the start of the podcast, everyone is so good at giving advice and very few of us are good at taking it. So even if you... Even if you know that that's true, and no one would argue with that point, you know, everyone would say that's true. But it's then it's still very difficult to take that on and actually live that phrase literally and go, okay, well, yeah, I believe that phrase, but I'm not really going to try hard at being a golfer, even though I love golf and I'm actually pretty good at it. But I'm not really going to try because, like, man, who's got time for that? that? That's not realistic. Yeah, that's it, yeah. What, and it's like, well, what, what is realistic? Is it like just because everyone goes to a job that no one likes, that doesn't mean that that should be realistic. And that's just something that we've all accepted for for whatever reason. But that's no, you know, there's, you, people should be able to dream. And I think if you, J. Cole says it one, once, right? He said, if your dreams aren't, yeah, like if your dreams aren't big enough, like then dream, dream again or dream something else, yeah? And it's like, that's 100% like true. Like if your dreams aren't, at, if your dream is to be a receptionist, like dream bigger, like you should then dream to be H, like the department of the head of HR. And then you should dream, if that's not scaring you, then you should dream to have a H, like hold a company that like runs HR for other companies and you freelance. Do you know what I mean? Like whatever it is. Yeah, I think, I think you're hitting on the idea that you should not do something because you're scared of it is something that that I'm trying to reject now more and more because me and my friend were only talking the other day about like these feelings of fear or anxiety these are the feelings that you can't fake you know like this is how you know you, you feel alive and this is why you should do these things because they make you feel alive you know I think it's 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 easy to find yourself in comfortable positions and then yeah this is nice this is nice and then you see something that makes you anxious and then you say oh no i don't want to do that because that would take me outside this comfort zone but really when you're outside of that 
like you these are the times when you feel like alive do you remember that quote i sent yeah, you yeah, yeah yeah i'm just gonna bring it up but you can bring it up so it's uh, a short quote that you found the quote was something like I don't think anybody is searching for the meaning of life. They're just searching for the feeling to feel alive. And uh, I think everyone is just doing that unconsciously or subconsciously, whatever, yeah. I mean, comfort is the enemy of success. You don't get anywhere by being by being comfortable, you know? And that's, if we're going to, you know, Kobe Bryant recently passed away. And like it, for some reason, it really impacted me. I have no idea why, because I'm not a big basketball fan. And normally, I don't really care that much when celebrities die. But something about his death and what he stood for, and the fact that he got taken away at 41 years old by complete tragedy, it really hit me, man. But one of the things that that I was like really resonated with me was that one time he was talking to this commentator, right? And it was um, Stephen A. Smith, who's one of his friends. And he got like Stephen A. Smith got a new deal on ESPN and he was all happy about it and Kobe Bryant was like you, you should be happy but like that's dream bigger like dream like Oprah don't just be happy to be on the television channel you should be dreaming about and working towards owning the television channel you know and that's something that I buy into so so much is so people have said to me they've said to me with the podcast like oh how's it going I said good and I've told them like the plans that we've got or that I've got anyway for the for it for the future and people have said like oh be careful like take it slowly and this that and the other and I get what they're saying you know you don't want to build yourself up just to to be shot back down but equally I don't want this podcast to only be listened to by 10 people you know I, I really want this to go far and I want it, I, you know, in my mind, I want it to be the best mental health podcast that there is. Slowly but surely, but that's what my aim is. My aim isn't just to be, to keep at this level for the rest of, for the rest of the time that we record. My aim is to constantly improve in every aspect of what it is to be a podcaster, you know. And I think have, having that ambition, it can be quite daunting and it can scare off other people, by the way. Like when you talk to people, it can scare them off because they go, oh, fuck that. I don't want to talk to him. Like he's in a different world. Like I'm just happy living here in my like chilled little house, like in my chilled office vibes. And I don't really want someone to push me on. But I think we should all have someone that pushes us on to dream bigger and to, and not just dream, but actually work towards that goal. You know, we can all say these things. Man, I, look, I have so many people in my life that do that for me. And again, we're talking about inspirations, but Joe Rogan is one of those people. Uh, but you can you can find those inspirations everywhere. But I think it's such an important thing to strive for. Um, and there's no there's no there's nothing wrong with failing at it. Obviously, it's not no one likes to fail. But if you do, at least you can. At least you don't have the regrets. My my biggest regret or my biggest fear in life. This is like one hundred percent serious. My biggest fear in life is that I'm on my deathbed when I'm eighty whatever years old 90 100 or 50 whatever it may be and i regret not going for something i regret being like oh fuck we should have done that podcast with jim i really think that could have gone somewhere but i didn't do it or oh shit i should have tried to open that restaurant but i didn't do it because of this this and this or whatever it may be you know that's like my biggest fear that i that i could possibly imagine to be sat on my deathbed and to go if i had if i had another go at life i would have done it so much differently so that's why I've, that's why I launched the podcast with you, and that's why I'm tra that's why I'm doing jujitsu, man. I've been talking about jujitsu to my friends for so long now, and it's like, bro, oh, you're great, either gonna do it or you're not gonna do you, it. So I'm like, wow, all right, that's it. We're starting mm. on Monday. Let's see how it goes. You know, I'm looking forward to hearing about it, man. I'm gonna be a black belt in the UFC, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> nah, I'm too short. Sure. I'd have to make what is it, 125 pounds, and I think I'm about 250 right now. So I'd never make the weight, but two two, two four five, man. <laughs> oh yeah, going the heavyweight division with Francis and Garner, and he'll knock me into to next week. But listen, um, I think we should probably leave it there. But I think it's something that we should, we can definitely um, touch on again uh, because I think there's so much that we haven't really unpacked here that we Agreed. could do again. But we don't want to yeah, keep man. the listener on for three hours as much as me and you would like to. So um, should we leave it there? And we'll I'll, I'll just bring up the. Um, the podcast that's going to come out after this, which is uh, with a good friend of mine, um, Tom Swan, he's a school friend, and he's had a really um, kind of traumatic few years dealing with um, a tumour that he, they found in the brain, and he's just kind of been dealing with the consequences of that and, and, and of what his new reality looks like. And he's ha he had a really positive aspect on his life, and I think it's something that we could all learn for, learn from, and you know, 
I've just been talking about ambition, but he wanted, all he wants now is normality back in his life. And I think there's, whilst it's brilliant to have ambition, like I've just been banging on about for the past 10 minutes, I also think we should couple that with being happy to be healthy, to be, to have a normal life, you know, that shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, so I would really implore anyone to listen to that podcast. Obviously I want you to listen to all of our podcasts, but I think it's one that really kind of puts things into perspective and it definitely made me put my life into perspective and what I want from this life and what I take for granted, you know? So please tune in in two weeks time for that one, because I think, I think it's one of our most moving ones yet. We've got a lot more like that to come, but from now it's definitely one of our most moving and, and most profound ones, I think. So listen in to that. But um, if you've been listening to this all the way through, we thank you so much, guys. Um, like, subscribe, share it, word of mouth, all of that stuff. Send us the five-star rating if you think we're worthy. It means a lot to us. It helps us get our, It helps us get out there, you know, we talking about ambition we want this podcast to spread as far and wide as possible and we can only do that with your help so if you think this is good enough and if you would recommend it to if you think you a friend could listen to it then please go ahead and recommend and jim if you want to say anything else before we send them off uh, you did it perfectly man nice one so we'll leave it there um, and we'll be back in two weeks time but until then have a good one